let's say I have this function f of x equals 3x squared over x squared plus 1. And I can use the first derivative test, the second derivative test. Actually, you know what? I'll go through it quickly. And I can use my graphing calculator to cheat. What's my first derivative? My first derivative for that. Quit here. F9. Where is it? F1. 8 clear. OK. Let me find the first derivative. And I'm not going to 3x squared divided by x squared plus 1 with respect to x. Take the derivative with respect to x. And the derivative of that, if you do the math and you simplify it, 6x over x squared plus 1 squared. Now leave a space there. If I do the second derivative, <coughs> the second derivative is the part I like. And quickly there, it's negative 18 x squared minus one third over x squared plus one to the third power. So I'm giving you the derivative completely simplified and everything. So you can rewrite this actually if you want negative 18 times the minus one third, that's six minus 18 x squared over x squared plus 1 cubed. I'm going to go through the whole thing because where we go with this is we're going to use the first derivative and second derivative to help us graph this function. To graph it, I need to know where the function is increasing, where the function is decreasing. How is it increasing and how is it decreasing? So here we go. I'm going to take a sheet of paper. I'll come back and I'll put this back, don't worry. And on this, I'm going to summarize everything. Then I'm going to show you why we're covering infinite limit, because right now there's something missing. I'm going to use, there we go. This is for the first derivative. And this is for the second derivative. So this is the beginning, right here. Notice my domain here, there is not a value that will make the bottom zero. See that? Because you're adding one to it. The domain x belongs to r, all real numbers. So this is really negative infinity, and I'm going all the way to infinity. What do you mean? This one? X belong to R, which is what's what's R? All real. Yep. So it's saying X all real numbers. So there is no exception. If this was X squared minus one, then there are two values I can't use: the plus one, the minus one. But not here. That's a plus one. So now let's look at the first derivative. I need to know where the first derivative is equal to zero and where the first derivative is undefined because these are the critical value. And define is what makes the bottom zero. What makes the bottom zero? None. There's not a single value that will make the bottom of this derivative zero. What makes the top zero? X will have to be zero. So I'm going to go to the first derivative, and there's only one critical value, that's the zero. That's your possible min-max. Remember that? If you're going to have a min or a max, it's going to be at this point, possible, 
I didn't say definite, possible min max. So this is my zero. And I'll find the y value. When x is zero, let me plug it in. Clear, here we go. Uh, 3x squared divided by <coughs> x squared plus 1. So when x is 0, the y value is 0. I plugged into the original function, not the derivative. And let me take a test point for the first derivative before the 0 and one after the 0. What should we use before the 0? Negative 1 after the 0? One. 1. Notice, here we go, what's the derivative at negative 1? That's negative 6 over a positive number. The bottom is squared, which means positive. That's a negative. Oh, do it backward. I can draw the arrow going down, but it will look silly. And what's the derivative at 1? That's 6 over positive, which is what? Positive. So that's your min point. 0, 0 is your min point decreasing then increasing <coughs> bless you let's do the second derivative the second derivative now I got the second derivative where is the second derivative equal to zero well it's equal to zero when x squared equals one-third which means x equals plus or minus 1 over the square root of 3. Where is the second derivative undefined? None. Now I go to the second derivative and I have two cuts in it. There's the second derivative. Hmm? one here and one here this is minus one over the square root of three this is positive one over the square root of three and let me get the y value for them just while i'm here negative 1 divided by the square root of 3. That's 0 0.75. And the other one, 1 divided by the square root of 3. And that's 0 0.75. By the way, this number here, it's negative 0.57. So I have to use a value less than negative 0.57. Should I use a minus 1? I can use a 0 for a test point, and I can use a 1. 0.57, more than that, that's a 1. Between negative 0.57 plus 0.57, I'm using 0. And let's use that one. Let's find the second derivative the second derivative in each one of these. So what is the second derivative at negative one? There's my second derivative. This is gonna be a positive in the bottom. Six minus 18. Is that a negative over positive, which is what? Negative. Concave downward. <clears throat> X 
f prime of 0. 6 over positive, which is what? Positive. <coughs> Concave which way? Upward. And the last one, f double, up, double prime of 1, 6 minus 18 over a positive. That's a negative. Concave which way? Downward. So guess what? I have everything I need to know. This is an inflection point. This is inflection point. So I can make this really one test question. Tell me where the function is increasing. Tell me where the function is decreasing. Tell me where the min point or the max point. Tell me where the function is concave downward. Where the function is concave upward. Inflection point and graph it. Let's go, to, and this is what we're going to use actually every single time. That's what this section, how do you graph? Actually, that's the next section. But before we get to it, I figured I'll tackle this one to show you my concern here. Now, I'm going to graph this. So I'm actually doing the next section with this problem instead of this section. But you'll see why we're covering this section before it. I go to graph it. I go, okay. Here we go. In the first piece, right there, the function is decreasing and it's concave which way? Downward. So I know I have an inflection point. Somewhere here I have an inflection point. A zero, zero, that's a min. It was concave down, then concave up. It looks like this. It was concave down, then up. Let's see what happens. And there's another inflection point here. That's a horrible picture where I drew it there. Inflection point. Here's what I know. Before this point, the function is what? Decreasing concave which way? Downward. Mm. Decreasing concave downward. It looks like this. And from this point to this point, what's going on? It's decreasing, but which way? Upward. Then what about from this point to that point? Increasing concave which way? Upward. Then what happens after that? Increasing but it's concave what? Downward. <coughs> and my next question is, how high does it go now? Where does it start from and where does it end at? Does it keep going all the way to infinity? Does this one go all the way from negative, from infinity down? That's where the problem actually comes in. You're going to find out, what is the problem here? Let me take a look at this problem. This problem actually does not go all the way to infinity. It will start from 3, and it will level at 3. So when you graph this, it's going to come from the height of 3, like this, decrease down. And it's going to level at 3. It will never go above that. How did I know it's 3? That's actually what this section is going to show us, how to find where the function starts from and where the function ends at. Because that gives us this line, which is known as what? Horizontal asymptote. That's my horizontal asymptote. Where the, does the function start from and where does it end at? So that's really why we're looking at that section. The limit as x approaches negative infinity and the limit as x approaches infinity. Where are we starting from and where are we ending at? If it's the same number, we have a horizontal asymptote. If there are different numbers, we don't have one. Might be a slant asymptote. 
So when I start writing limit at infinity, I'm going, didn't we cover that before? And I wasn't thinking about this. Then I said, oh, I know why we're covering this here again. Because I know we covered the limit at infinity. Because that tells us where the function is going to start from. At x approaches negative infinity. At x approaches infinity, that will tell us where the function is going to end at. So let's look at the limit at infinity. In case you forgot there, limit at infinity. So you want to know where the function starts from. You take the limit of the function as x approaches negative infinity. That's the one we just graphed. And I said to you, it's going to start from 3, it's going to end at 3. Well, how did I figure that out? If you remember the process for the limit at infinity, we do what? We divide by x to the highest power. And what is our highest power of x here? Isn't that x squared? So we're going to divide each one of them by x squared. So that would be 3x squared over x squared over x squared over x squared plus 1 over x squared. So you end up with the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 3 divided by what? 1 plus 1 over x squared. Now, any term that has x in the bottom or x squared or x cubed will go to 0 because that's an infinite. 1 over infinity is tiny. So this will go to 0, and you end up 3 over 1, which is what? 3. Wait, explain why you cross that out again? Because x goes to infinity. Okay. So what is 1? It's a negative infinity. Okay, what's 1 divided by negative a million? Point z negative point zero 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 because now a million squared. So that number becomes negative point zero zero eleven zeros and one at the end. And that's a zero. That's why we don't count that. And where does it end at? You take the limit as x approaches infinity. And it's the same process. We divide by x to the highest power. So when you divide every one of them by x squared, you end up with 3 over 1 plus 1 over x squared. And again, this will go to 0. And you end up with 3 over 1, which is 3. This number matches that number, your horizontal asymptote. at y equals 3, the y value, the height. You're going to start from y equals 3, and you're going to go down, come back to y equals 3. <coughs> I panic. I thought I put the wrong card in this one, the wedding pictures. Like, oh, no. because I brought it to copy it on my machine. So that's the whole idea of looking at horizontal asymptotes. They tell us where the function starts from and where the function ends at. Now, we're not, so we're going to practice the limit at infinity quickly just to make sure you get that part. But that's the reason for it. Let me take a few more examples. Find the limit as x approaches infinity of 5 minus 2 over x squared. Remember, any term that has x in the bottom, x squared, x cubed is going to go to where? To 0 when x approaches infinity. So this will go to 0. The 5 is always 5, regardless what happens, 5 minus the 0, which is what? 5. What's the limit as x approaches infinity 
of 3 over e to the x. Now think about this. When x approaches infinity, what's going to happen to e to infinity? Which one is 0? When x approaches infinity, what's e to the infinity? No? Big number, right? Just imagine if I use, <coughs> let's say I use infinity. I go, you know what? Let me just do this on my calculator. Let me get out of this. F18. Oh, F18. OK, clear. Let me try e to the million. Let's see if this calculator can do that. Where is e on this one? Try this one. I got two of them I'm working with today. Clear. Let's try e to the million, just to give you an idea how big that number. I don't think this calculator can do e to the million. How about e to the thousand? Overflow already. Uh, let's see, e to the power. Uh, let's go to it. Instead of, let's make that delete. How about e to the 100? Look how big that number. 10 to the power of 43. Can you see it? So what is 3 over that? So this number is really big. Big number. What is 3 divided by a huge number? It's going to be tiny, tiny number. That's a 0. Will never be zero on the money. Yeah, Will be point zero 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 zero. Just take three divided by that number. Well, that's only if it's x squared, not e to the x. So if you have, so if it's approaching the negative infinity, e would be closer to zero. So Let's see. Three over e to the negative infinity. Good question. Or oh, negative infinity, I'm sorry, e to the x. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. I wrote the whole thing wrong there. So this becomes 3 over e to the negative infinity. So let's see what happens to e to the negative infinity. Again, infinity is really big here. So I'll get close to it. I'll go e to the minus 100. And what's that number? So I get 3 over a small number. See that? Can you see that number? 10 to the minus 44. Very small number. So when you do 3 over that number, what will happen? Isn't that infinite now? The whole thing becomes approaching infinity. Yeah. So when this is a negative number, or e to the negative infinity, that becomes a very small number. I use e to the minus 100 as infinity, and I came up with 3.72 10 to the minus 44. 3 over that number becomes the power of 43. That's a huge number. So th that means if that was the case, your function is going to start from infinity when you graph it way up there, and God knows what's going to happen after that. You know? What's the limit of 2x minus 1 over x plus 1 as x approaches infinity, plus or minus infinity? Again, this is straightforward. You divide by x to the highest power. What is the highest power of x? It's x, right? So what's 2x over x? 2 minus 1 over x over 1 plus 1 over x. As x becomes a huge number, what is 1 over a big number? 0. What's 1 over a big number? 0. So you end up with what? 2 over 1, which is 2. So how come in your first example there, as far as infinity, you didn't divide 2 divided by x squared by x squared? Divided what? 
be a first example, <laughs> five minus, yeah. Yep. Why didn't you divide both, all three of those by all <coughs> I could, but I got to rewrite that, because that's not a fraction. The question for this, why don't you divide this by x squared? So here's the question Nico's asking. I think what he's asking, why didn't I divide the 5 by x squared, right? Well, if you want to do that, first you've got to rewrite that. You can't just divide the 5. You're going to change the value of that. So you're going to find the LCD for that. And that becomes 5x squared minus 2 over x squared. Now divide each one by x squared because that's x to the highest power. And what are you going to have? What's 5x squared divided by x squared? 5. 2 divided by x squared. What's x squared by x squared? 1. And what's going to happen to this one? 0. 5 minus 0. 5 over 1. Still 5. That was a constant. You can't just divide this. See, if it's a fraction, you got to do the top and the bottom, every one of them, divided by x to the highest power. Why can't you take the coefficient of the highest? Ah. And because everything before that just Correct. doesn't matter. <coughs> well, I don't want to do that till I figure I'd do one more example. But you saw that already. And you spoil it now. Let me try one more example. Hopefully nobody heard you. I'll make them like this. Or even 5x plus 7. It doesn't really matter. Just have fun with it. We're going to notice that's a fraction. I'm going to divide every one of them by x to the highest power. And what's the highest power of x here? Is that x squared? So what's 2x squared divided by x squared? 2. What is 4x divided by x squared? Good. What is 3x squared divided by x squared? 3. What's 5x divided by x squared? And the last one is what? 7 over x squared. So I can't just make my own rule. I'm just saying, that's a fraction. If I divide the top by something, I'll divide the bottom by the same thing. Let me divide everything by x squared, every one of them. And what's going to happen now? Any term that has x in the bottom or x squared will go to 0 as x approaches infinity. And you end up with what? 2 thirds. Well, Mr. White noticed something. I said, you know, why are you doing all this work? If the highest power is the same, I did these two examples with this intention of the highest power being the same. Notice the highest power is 2. Take the two terms with the highest power and divide their coefficient. What is 2 divided by 3? Isn't that your answer? 2, what's the number here? 1. What's 2 divided by 1? So if they have the highest power, if the highest power of the top equals the highest power of the bottom, take the coefficient of those two terms and divide them, and that's your answer. You don't have to go through that. So if I see a problem like this now, I don't have to spend time doing that. I notice the highest power of the top and the bottom is equal. x to what power? 6. I'll just take the coefficient of these two. 7 over what? Negative 9.
And again, if you divide everything by x to the 6, you end up with that answer. Okay. What about if the exponents, the highest power, is not the same? Let's look at this scenario where the top is less than the bottom. What's the highest power of x? Cube. So if you divide by x to the third, you'll have what? I'll have 5 over x on the top. What's x cubed divided by x cubed? 1 plus what? 8 over x cubed. Yep, as x approaches infinity, this one goes to 0. This one goes to 0. What are you going to have? 0 over 1, 0. What's the limit as x approaches negative infinity? doesn't matter if it's positive or negative infinity. 7x to the 6 over x to the 8th minus 9x to the 6 plus 4. What's the highest part of x? 8. So if you divide by x to the 8, what are you going to have? 7 over x squared. 1 minus 9 over x squared plus 4 over x to the 8th. Anything that has x in the bottom of it will go to 0. So what's your answer again? 0. So if the fraction is bottom heavy, bottom heavy, that means the bottom has a larger power than the top, the result is always zero. Always. Bottom heavy, the result is zero. How about if it's top heavy? Again, divide by x squared. That would be 1 over what? 1 over x plus what? 3 over x squared. And these two will go where? To 0. So that's 1 over 0. We, undefined. Undefined means what? When you graph it, either we're going to start either plus infinity or minus infinity. You're going to start from way up there or way down here. That's where you're going to start from. So when you're graphing your function, if it's if top heavy, that tells your function is going to start high, either plus infinity or minus infinity. How do you know if it's going to be plus infinity or minus infinity? Well, if this is decreasing, well, if it's decreasing, then where is it coming from? It has to be plus infinity to decrease. If this is increasing, that means it's coming from where? Negative infinity to increase. So if it's top heavy, the answer is always undefined, which means plus or minus infinity. And that's how we find the limits for most of these problems. Same coefficient, just I mean the same power, just divide them. Bottom heavy is zero, top heavy is infinity. Any other ones, if you have sine, cosine, then plug them in. Now what happens if I have sine or cosine, just quickly there on this section? You can't use top heavy, bottom heavy. That's only for a fraction, plain, straightforward, polynomial divided by a polynomial. Here you got sine of x. <clears throat> well, if you start plugging infinity there, what are you going to have? 
you're going to have 1 over 2 times infinity till infinity plus sine of infinity. Well, here's the good news. The sine of anything is always between 0 and 1. So this is going to be a number between 0 and 1. That's it. Big deal. If you take infinity and add to it 1 or infinity and take away 1 from it, is it really going to change anything? No. So you're going to end up with what? 1 over infinity, which is what here? 0. Zero. 1 over a big number. That's a small number. That's a 0. That's how you'll do these problems. If I gave you the limit as x approaches, I'll say negative infinity of 2x over Two x over sine of x. Well, that's hard actually to tell to answer. To be honest with you. Let me reverse that. Let me make it the way I don't like the way I wrote it there. Sine of x over two x. Well, this is going to be a number between. The sign is always between what? Between negative 1 and 1. Some number. It could be minus 1. It could be as high as 1. You're going to divide that by 2 times negative infinity, which is what? A negative infinity. Just think about it. Let's say the worst case scenario. This is a minus 1. What's minus 1 over negative infinity? And the other case, what's 1 over negative infinity? That's going to be like negative 0 0.00000001, 0 0 1, right? Which is what? 0. There's no negative 0 and positive 0. What's 1 over negative infinity? Again, that's a negative. This will be a plus, I'm sorry. This will be a minus 0.00000001. That's still a zero. So regardless if this is a minus one or one, when you divide that number by a huge number, the result is going to be a zero. So the answer to this is zero. If you reverse that, it's a problem because that would be negative infinity divided by, depends on sine of x, if it's positive or negative. That's why you can answer it. Could be positive, could be negative. So that's that section. That section infinite limit. So that tells us where the function is starting from and where the function is ending at. Let me add to it one more example, which we were doing that. Put all the stuff together that we learned. How do we graph? 